name is Rory O'Toole. And my name is Matt Schultz. And this is How to Be. The podcast where we discuss ancient wisdom, modern hacks, paperback self-help books, and pithy platitudes. In the hopes of figuring out the best way to live this one precious and wild life. Today, we are talking about habits. Is it possible to create good ones for a lifetime and finally kick the bad? Will flossing ever be fun? Join us as we discuss building a life of habits. Hi, Matt. Hey, Roar. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing just fine. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I'm glad to doing hear it. Doing my best. Um, okay. So I need some, I don't know if advice is the right word, but I would really appreciate some feedback, just sharing your thoughts. Um, you That's know, if you could advise for. me, advise, but not give advice. <laughs> I'll listen. I'll be a bouncing. Board. But an active listener. Okay. Backboard. I am bombing at work, by which I mean my jokes are not landing. And I cannot just help myself from making them. Are you- comp- I have a compulsion. So as you know, I recently started a new job. And my last job, I had been there for a long time. I had a small team and they were, you know, happy to indulge me. They felt, yeah. Most of the time. I don't know if they felt me, but they were, you know, uh, a polite audience. <laughs> mm-hmm. Recently, I made this joke and oh, the crickets that were singing. <laughs> Do you have the joke ready for us? Yeah, yeah, it's ready. OK, let me <laughs> let me know what you think. OK, so I have this coworker. She's a little bit younger than me. She's in her late 20s and she ha- she's talking about like a bunch of weddings she has to go to. And I said, oh, well, now that I'm in my mid thirties, all the weddings are over. I guess I have to wait till everyone gets divorced and marries again. That's the joke. Yeah. I don't even know. Is that a joke? I'm not. (laughs) I thought you were supposed to say yes. And Um, (laughs) this is my yes. And I laughed. It was supposed to be. Obviously, that's a joke. Like, I'm not. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's like, I feel like I have to wait till people get divorced and then go to the next wedding. I feel like that's just an observation. It was said with humor, though. I hope that none of, I hope my friends don't get divorced, obviously. I don't know. I think you may want to examine the delivery. That just sounds like a little bit of, you know. No, that's a joke. That's office joke right there. Now I have to wait for their second weddings. Actually, that's how I said it. I have to wait for okay it's okay i here's my question (laughs) you do not like my response right now now could you tell the joke this is first of all i don't think you should be quote telling jokes at the office i cannot help it like they come into my brain and they come out of my mouth i know but it's a little too much like it's a joke it's like a you know like a yuck yuck but here, here's the one joke that you should tell. This is one of your best jokes. Can you tell that Jewish joke that your dad told? <laughs> because the thing about this joke is that the story of the joke is a joke and could be a classic joke. I've told the story of the joke, not the joke. <laughs> but in order to tell the story <laughs> of the joke, you have to tell the joke. Exactly. But in it's that's what's great about it. The joke, the actual joke then becomes the setup for an even greater joke. Now I have to tell the joke because you like said it. Yeah. So please. OK, please it. okay let me get an abridged version here. So <laughs> at my brother's rehearsal dinner, my dad gave a very nice speech. OK. And then, of course, he had to ruin it by telling a joke, <laughs> like a joke, classic joke, joke. OK. Real yuck, yuck. So he sets up the joke (laughs) by saying two Jews at the Jewish (laughs) (laughs) retirement home. And he gave them names, right? He was like, yeah, they were named Mrs. Cohen and like Mr. Um, 
Shapiro. like golden golden it was Shapiro it was Shapiro something like <laughs> it was Shapiro Mrs. Cohen was at the so he's setting up this Jewish joke okay so this is the joke Mrs. Cohen you know she wanted to she decided she was going to get into prostitution so Mr. Shapiro came by and she he said what are your prices Mrs. Cohen says um well it's five dollars for uh the floor uh ten dollars standing up and twenty dollars for the bed and mr cohen says okay here's twenty dollars and she said okay you want to do it on the bed and he says no i want to do it five times four times on the floor so obviously (laughs) by the end of the joke it's not a jewish joke it's like a raunchy old person sex joke joke. yeah the jewishness has not played in yeah (laughs) so at the after he gave a speech like i asked him i said dad why is this a jewish joke no 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 you're messing it up (laughs) you said dad why are their names cohen and shapiro no no this is it they're jewish roar no he said I said, Dad, why is it a Jewish joke? And he said, because their names are Cohen and Shapiro. Mm. I think it's better the other way (laughs) for the retail. Dad, so yeah, so this is how it becomes a classic joke. You tell the whole joke, you go, by the end of the joke, the Jewishness hadn't even come into play. So I go up to him and I say, Dad, why the hell did you say that their names are Cohen and Shapiro? And then your dad says, because they're Jewish, Roar. Like, yeah, I think it works real. better the other way. We'll let our listeners decide. Just, and then I went up to my dad and I said, Dad, why did they have to be Jewish? Because their names are Cohen and Shapiro. I guess it works that way. Yeah, I think that's good too. And that's the way it really <laughs> did happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my poor brother endured that, but that's, you know, his fault for getting married with parents with a dad like, like that, you know? <laughs> Um, anyway my dad is a man of many habits tell that one at work (laughs) you'll have them on the edge of their seats my co-worker who just (laughs) who's currently chaperoning birthright would really appreciate it (laughs) i think she might matt what are we here to talk about today not my dad's jewish jokes of which i'm sure he has many others (laughs) (laughs) just jokes where the inhabitants of the universe of the joke happen to be Jews. <laughs> and you can't change it. That's just who they are. <laughs> um, it's a true story he was telling. <laughs> Today we're talking about um, a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, habits, the life of the habit. Um, specifically, I mean, we, we read this book for today called Atomic Habits. Um, if you're in the sort of self-help zone or if you're a corporate type of person, you probably know this book. It's by James Clear. It's all about um, tricks and tools to, to make yourself do your good habits, make yourself not do your bad habits, Make your good habits easier. Make your bad habits harder. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, that's the premise right there. Yeah, that's the premise. I mean, look, before we get like fully into it, his four, what are his, his four steps? They are make it obvious, make it um, attractive, make it easy, and make it satisfying, right? Yes. Okay. And then the opposite of that for bad habits, make it hard. Put the put the crispy cream donuts on the top shelf where you don't see them. <laughs> put the soda in the back of the fridge where you don't see it. Um don't buy soda. Don't yeah, that's like next there are all sorts of different levels that this could play <laughs> out at. Um so make it make it difficult, make it um not rewarding. I don't know. I forget how that works. Make it. Um, make it no, uh, is the first step make it obvious or make it easy? I think it's make it obvious. Yeah. Okay. So the opposite of obvious, make it not invisible. 
Make it, yeah, actually, yeah, I think it, it, that's what he says. Talk about that. Make it invisible. Um, and yeah, he, there's a lot of talk of like, after you watch the TV show, put the TV back in the box it came in from Best Buy and put it <laughs> under your bed. And, and then wrap it like another, a Christmas present. <laughs> you know, when you want to watch another show, you take the box out of the styrofoam again. And like, I got to say, I'm like, that's the category of stuff that I'm like, the le- that was my least favorite category of advice in the book. because Which was make it invisible or make it easy. Just like both, both sides of that coin. Like there are, okay. Like there are times when I've like wanted to like stop using grinder. So I'll like delete grinder, but not just delete grinder, like delete my account, you know, Mm -hmm. to make it hard for myself. Well, guess what? Then when your lower self surges up again and wants to use grinder, now you have this annoying chore that you're past you. Like, I I guess what I'm saying is like, it's not really going to stop you from watching another show. It is going to make it unpleasant. (laughs) And I don't like the idea of us like setting these booby traps for our future selves. It's, it sounds, I think it's mean spirited actually. Well, I mean, this speaks to a greater thing or greater um, aspect that I wanted to talk about, which is like these selves within the one self, you know, the self that for me wants to wake up early and the self that's sleeping and how they're every morning they're in battle with each other. They're armored up. You know who always wins? The um, self that wants to keep sleeping. In, in my Sam Harris book that I'm reading right now, the moral landscape, which as you know, I have a great many thoughts and questions about that. I've been trying to get the author's attention for on Twitter. (laughs) Um, I'm like, hello, I have questions about your book, but he, at one point he discusses that very issue and he's like, you know, it might be best to sort of think of the self as a council of past, present and future selves who Mm. do are certainly not unified in their interests, but do have some, some shared interests and, and understand they understand each other. At, at the very least, or they mm-hmm. understand the future future self understands that he's going to inherit the fruits of his actions as future self. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's interesting. I think I'm pretty good in like, let's say 85% of areas as like setting my future self up for happiness, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, but no one bats a thousand. Like I do sleep too late. Like I would be, you know, future self would be much happier if she could get up, not even that much earlier, 20 minutes on a work day, let's say. Um, But there are some people and like, I mean, that's a problem for people, I think, is impulsiveness in the moment. They really cannot feel the visceral feelings of their future self dealing with the mistake they're making in a moment. It's like hard to tune in. Yeah, well, I also think that we, when we do do that act of picturing, that we don't, we we don't quite picture it correctly. Like, I really think that, like, and this has been helpful for me at, at certain times, like, there's a tendency just in the most literal way to picture future self the way we picture other people, which is to say, like, the camera is on the outside of the head and not on the inside of the head. So we see, I see future Matt and, you know, whatever. And I find it very helpful to be like, let, let me get in there. Let me like, <laughs> you, know, really, I'm, you know, pull that skin over myself and picture like, what is this? What am I going to feel like? What like sort of noise is going to be in my head about this decision, about this, you know, whatever it may be, bad habit that I'm about to do, vice that I'm about to um, take part in, what's it really going to feel like get in there? And I, and I feel like that's sort of a way of remembering that future self is just a present self you haven't met yet. Tell me about it. And do you want that future self to be spiraling out about something? Yes. I mean, that has understanding my own 
tendency to spiral and really being becoming able to picture future self spiraling. Exactly. Helpful. The fear of the spiral keeps me in check. <laughs> the spiral okay? staircase. Like the, <laughs> tumbling the, down the spiral staircase. Of tomorrow. Barbara. Rory's spiral might inform today's Rory's decisions a little too much, actually. <laughs> it's the opposite problem. Well, yeah, I mean, that is legitimate too. Like, you know, we also, we don't want the future self to be um, a tyrant over the present. And I think we, you know, in our discussions about this book, like you talked about sort of the dreariness of this life of servitude to a future tyrant like exactly yeah like there's I think if you don't read this book carefully enough and I don't think that James Clear the author really does a good job of um tempering his advice with sort of the reminder to be balanced and um I think that it could get these habits can the rigidity around them can get out of control in the wrong hands. Um, So for example, one of his tenants is to like be as in control of your environment as you possibly can be. So don't like, if you don't want to, you know, eat, if you want to eat more healthy, don't have junk food in the house. If you want to start running, put your shoes in the middle of the bathroom or the middle of your shower so you see them when you take a shower in the morning and it's about having exerting extreme control over your environment. And it's like, that's not the answer to life. I'll tell you that much having more control over your environment. Yeah. So you are a big believer in the concept of going with the flow. Me? Yeah. Uh, do I go with the flow? I didn't say you go with the flow. <laughs> I said you are a believer. <laughs> I really am. I'm always sort of try reaching a little bit more for that. Well, I'm about finding a balance between the flow and still getting stuff done. Yeah. So I think this idea of like exerting utter total control over the environment, you know, that is so not flowy. And this this is a book about getting stuff done. It's not necessarily about psychological health. It's, no. I mean, it's definitely not. So that element, that sort of exerting total control, that is psychologically unhealthy. And as I've mentioned, I think the whole like the the, all of the stuff that's about like booby trapping or tricking yourself into doing things like that seems like a really exhausting way to live your life. And it's sort of an exhausting relationship to have with yourself. Yeah. Can you give an example for our listeners about like the booby traps he kind of suggests in the book oh okay so like signing a contract that you have to like pay someone five hundred dollars if you don't go to the gym every day for a month (laughs) yeah that was a real life example he gave like lauding it like thinking that was a genius idea yeah if you go to jamesclear.com you can download a template of that contract i'm shaking my head now like Shaking my head. The tedium of having that relationship with your daily life and with yourself. Is life not for experiencing joy? I think it is. I mean, but at the same time, I do appreciate the desire to cultivate habits in your life because a life with no structure, you know, I can think can just can be maybe wanton. Mm -hmm. Sort of you're not fully engaged with your life sometimes that way as well. That's true. But I'm more, I, I'm, I was much more into his, his carrot ideas rather than his stick ideas. So, you know, we, we took on habits for, to like, try this, to try this out. Um, I, I mean, I took on like 70 habits because I'm on summer break right now. My whole life is like modules and habits, self-imposed structure really, (laughs) gives me a thrill, a almost perverse thrill. <laughs> but one of the habits I took on was meditation. Now, how do I get myself to meditate? I've always wanted to be a meditator. I, I don't do it. Well, how did I, what did James Clear give me that has allowed me to meditate every single day for these two to three weeks, whatever it's been, sometimes more than once a day, 
I seduce myself. I come into my room. I put on sexy underwater aquarium lighting, you know, blues, (laughs) reds, um, twinkle lights, maybe light a candle. I put on sensual vibey music, maybe a 10 hour singing bowl YouTube (laughs) video (laughs) or some William Basinski. I slip into my kimono. (laughs) And then guess what? I've just transformed myself into a new person. And this person, this kimono boy, it's not hard for him to meditate. It's what he does. Yeah. So what you're talking about, I think you're talking about two things. One is the rule, make it satisfying. So, you know, there are ways that you can take habits that are very unappealing and make them more appealing, enhancing them, if you will, seducing yourself into um, meditation as opposed to making it this um, rigid thing on your to-do list, finding a way to make yourself, you know, even look forward to it, let's say. Yeah. But I think it's also the, the rule that I was really channeling is he talks about that there are these like moments of consequence where you know, I think of it as like getting in a barrel and going over a waterfall. Now it's easy to get into a barrel. It's hard to go over a waterfall, but if you just, once you've made the easy decision to get in the barrel, going over the falls just happens. So like he talks about like, what is this example you're using a barrel and a waterfall? Is that like a common trope? Yeah. People go over like Niagara falls in a barrel. What? (laughs) Really? Yeah. Who? Like thrill Crazy seekers? People. Yeah, thrills. <laughs> like 19, people in like the 1920s, I think. They would get into like a barrel barrel? What yeah, was in picture- those? What did they keep in those barrels ever? Uh, whiskey. Wheat? What? <laughs> Definitely <Okay>. not wheat. <laughs> it's for a liquid. It's, it's for liquid. <laughs> it's for liquid. Okay. They'd get in a whiskey barrel and float down the Niagara. No jump down the Niagara they go over the falls yeah woo! and they survived I guess I'll look into this but I don't think they all survived (laughs) okay so you getting in the barrel is easy and then you take the long plunge yeah so like getting in the kimono is easy exactly and then the kimono makes the next move it's kind of like that saying like you take the first drink, the second, the first drink takes the second drink and the third drink takes you. So that's like how it works with a bad habit, binge drinking. (laughs) But with a good habit, it's like you put on the kimono, the kimono holds your hand. Well, meditation sends you to Nirvana. Um, well, this also speaks to a good point that he had. And, um, I think that it has helped me cultivate good habits and get rid of bad ones is really what you need to be successful with a habit is to have a shift in identity. So you're shifting yourself from day Matt, who just, you know, lives life, walks three hours a day, modules his life up to goddess hour Matt, who's Mm -hmm. slipping his kimono on. You have the identity of someone who takes sensual meditation breaks at the end of the day yeah um, and that has worked for me before because like there was a you know in my early 30s I wasn't doing any exercise and I was like I can't be someone who has no working out no physical activity in their life living this like sedentary job no activity on the weekend you know what I mean like I wasn't living an active lifestyle not that I live an active lifestyle now okay I don't know but um that identity was like one that I didn't want anymore so I was like oh I have to start like doing something for you know my physical health um to keep the body in motion Exactly. So I started, so I found yoga and like, I don't, I would never consider myself a yogi, but I would consider myself someone who like has some level of movement consistency in their life, consistently in their life. And I think that as long as we have these egoic selves, we might as well put them to use, dragging us towards the good, the good life. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Also, you know, one might employ their sense of self-righteousness, you know, if we want to feel (laughs) a little 
superior to those around us that can which absolutely uh, that's how I get that's how why I became a dirty person to now I'm a clean person yeah you wanted to be able to feel superior I want someone to be able to pop by my house at any time on I don't know they're coming over they walk into my house this never happened and they say (laughs) oh they think in their head they don't even need to say it I know they're thinking it Rory keeps her house clean, even when pe- she doesn't know people are coming over. Do you know how many times I've envisioned that scene? Yeah, you have this whole little play that you put on in your head that involves other people and that you may <laughs> turn towards the stage and give a little soliloquy. <laughs> about how clean my living room is. Then they go home and they feel like inspired by me. Yeah, I'm, um, absolutely. And I think also maybe... Uh, might might it also involve being able to look at someone else's home and saying, I never, you know, <laughs> don't we get a little joy out of that every once in a while? It's a guilty joy. It's a little schadenfreude. It's a little shot exactly schadenfreude, but it's, I'm sure yeah. the Germans have some word for it. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think that I wish everyone lived a little bit cleaner, but I worry for them sometimes, especially these people working from home and their environment's chaotic. I'm like, (gasps) (laughs) (laughs) but there we go. The righteousness, the righteousness right there. I mean, there. Um, Yeah. And I think, you know, like this, I, I have a little I have a little play that I put on where I call myself a doer of things. Matt's a doer of things. He just does things. I don't know who's saying this. Other people and a <laughs> chorus of people in my head. It's like it's like the townsfolk in Beauty and the Beast singing. <laughs> Look at Matt taking out the garbage. <laughs> yeah. Just you someone who, do, who sees something and takes care of it right away. Mm-hmm. And literally every time I do it, I feel so proud of myself that I, I bring out this entire French village to sing for me. <laughs> this book has, I, I could have written this book. Because you, I, I think that you would have written a better book, a more generous book. Maybe I will. <laughs> maybe Absolutely. I will. Yeah. I'm a writer. Mm-hmm. Um, but this book is two of its main points are things that I've been saying for years, but I think I, I say it in more vivid language. Mm, as um, a writer. As a, yeah. I'm not just a master of modules and a king of habits, a habit king. So one of them is is something that my, my veterinarian said to me, my cats, my dearly departed cats veterinarian, which is we don't we don't train cats. We set things up so that things go well for them. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that life isn't always just about battling with the self. Sometimes the self is an untamable beast. And the best thing we can do is understand its nature and then set up our life to to be in accordance with that nature and in accordance with our, our goals. So it's not about dragging yourself to the gym each day and forcing yourself to do all these different things. But, you know, having a home and a lifestyle that actually within that context, you make good decisions and you have good habits. Okay. So yes, agreed. And I want to talk about that because we, where do we find the balance between doing things that we don't enjoy because we know they're good for us versus living a joyful, pleasurable life? I think James Clear in this book isn't very clear about that. I don't think that everyone should read this book and come up with like 20 things that they really want to do, all of which they haven't done because they hate them so much. I don't think your life should be about creating an environment where it's slightly easier to do the things that you hate. Now, that being said, there are things in life that you have to do or that not you don't have to do anything. There are things in life that, you know, you should your quality of life might improve if you are able to sort of integrate that into these things into your life um, in a way that is somewhat less, I don't, I don't even want to go so far as to say enjoyable, but causes less suffering. So for example, say you want to exercise or move your body more. 
like I was saying, I wanted to do um, Mm -hmm. how I found yoga for years and years. I would just try and force myself into running and I would put on the running shoes as soon as I got home from work. So, which is advice that he would definitely give, but I never stuck with it, no matter how much I habit stacked or took his advice Mm -hmm. to make it more satisfying, listening to music, listening to podcasts, because I don't enjoy running. There has to be some level of harmony that these habits sort of fit into your life um, in a way that you find amenable. So well, what was I really trying to do? The other yeah. day, you came up with a rule. Yeah. Well, the rule I said was, what was the rule? If you hate it, you can only do things that you hate for under 10 minutes a day. Yes, you could only, okay. Yes, you can only do things that you hate for under 10 minutes a day, but keep the list of things that you really hate as short as you possibly can. So for me, I felt like you have this long list of things that you hate, right? I have like maybe 10 daily, not even, whatever. My example is flossing. I really hate flossing, but I think flossing is very important. I had a bad experience at, um, the dentist and it scared me straight. Okay. So now I floss and how, one of the ways I started flossing was many, not many years ago, five or five years ago or something. I said, Matt, how do I floss more? And you iterated to me a tenant that James clear very much. So pushes, you said, what did you say to me? Put the floss where you can see it. Exactly. That's why that's the second thing that Um, you have originated that he also um, says in his book. Yeah. And I don't just mean that about floss. I mean, it universally, obviously it's very true for floss, but also, you know. Yeah. Why is that floss hiding in my cabinet? It needs to be right out there. (laughs) Yeah. Calling to me like a siren. (laughs) Yes. The floss should, you should be communicating with the floss. The floss will be like, come here. Now I went to the dentist today. Is this this was a much anticipated dental visit for Matt because it's been two years. He's been two years and he told as as I still complain about flossing, okay, because I hate it, but I have to do it. Matt told, also gave me the advice recently to just stop flossing. You don't have to do it. And I said, Well, let's see what happens when, when you go to the dentist, what the dentist says. So what did yeah, the dentist so this say? Is to either you? Gonna be, this is gonna be an I told you so moment because I've been like, I'm gonna be fine. And you're like, you're gonna have a big mouth full of cavities and you're gonna come crying to me. And I, I actually think that you've been a little bit gleefully waiting for me to get bad news. I know I detected a bit of eager Christmas, Christmas Eve. Well, I will say that a certain, at a certain point, your hubris was vexing to me. Oh, my teeth. No, no. I have special Matt teeth. So now I'm wondering who's going to say, I told you so you or me. Yeah. (laughs) I have two cavities. Two. That's not bad. It's not bad. It's bad. He said I was doing pretty good, but he did say that I need to start flossing. Mm. Oh, so when a dentist says it, you'll do it. Not when your old friend Roar says it. Well, I don't want two cavities. And um, and I am going to become a flossing queen now. It was flossing. literally days ago that you told me that flossing sucks. Don't do it. I <laughs> Yeah, would you would you go up to Paul of Tarsus and say it was literally days ago that you were calling yourself Saul and saying that Jesus is not the savior? You know, I had a I had a conversion experience today. <laughs> also, the dentist, I've never like related to like the fear of dentists are uh, you know, I've always taken it in stride. Today I really got it. I really mm. felt it. The man is scraping your teeth. Mm. with a metal needle (laughs) and it's i cannot imagine a better torture for for the human soul really that that's the torture you need to go to the torture museum in um italy that i had to go to on a field trip once I would never, that would be, give me such um, intrusive thoughts of such images afterwards. No, I can certainly picture worse tortures, but it was, I was like, I was really, I mean, thank goodness for my newfound meditation skills. I was doing some real centering breathing and just trying to, you know, mm-hmm. 
like, you know, I, I was so in my teeth. My consciousness was right in my teeth. So I was like, you know what? I'm not just a mouth right now. I'm also <laughs> arms. I'm also legs. Can I inhabit this whole mm, body? Did you wear and your that, kimono? I did not, but. Were you like, but, doc, I need to set the mood lighting here. <laughs> I need the mood really- lighting to say, I go to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, world. <laughs> My name's Matt, and I go to the dentist, and I floss. But they did have soothing goddess music in the lobby, along with mm. um, images of of sea life. What's that? The flat thing that the stingray. That stingray, beautiful the way they move. Mm-hmm. I would Haunting. like to be a stingray. Yeah. That's how, that was your dentist trip. That's all, everyone in their thirties has a dentist trip like this. I'll tell you that much. In your twenties, the the arrogance, the arrogance, um, it catches up with you. Um, okay. You know what people love to say? No. People love to say like, it takes twenty one days for a new habit to be formed. <laughs> The number of days might change. The number of days definitely changes. Like it takes 21 days for a new habit to become routine. It takes 36 days for it to be ingrained. It takes six years for it to feel like nothing at all. You know? Yeah. It's like, this is okay. This is in within a category. We discuss this category a lot. You and me things people say that sound like facts that have no basis in reality whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, it's like, where, where did this determination come from? All it's it, For me, it falls into the category of if only, yeah, if only it was just a certain number of days of doing it that would make it so ingrained in you that it becomes effortless and you don't even need to think about it anymore. Yeah, it's very wish fulfillment because obviously, like, there's some habits that you do your whole life faithfully and, and there's still a pain in the ass. Yeah, like push-ups for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Years and years of of wrestling with myself to do them. <laughs> still waiting for, you know, maybe it'll be <laughs> maybe someday I'll write a book called 70,000 days to form a habit. Maybe after 70,000 days it'll click. But it's also that category of things like the most stressful things that happen in a, in a person's life, moving yes. a breakup. What are they? It's like divorce, death, and somehow moving got in there. Like somehow we as a culture think moving is the same as death, getting a divorce. And like, I can think of 300 things that are worse than moving, like being in a room. Being a woman locked in a room is probably the most stressful thing you could experience. Um, Well, she had to move there. That's moving. (laughs) Don't they thought of that. That's moving. Um, (laughs) It's a bad move. Yeah. It's like, and people are always saying it. Like it's a fact, like you're moving and and it's like, you know, well, moving is very stressful. It's one of the most stressful things. One of the three most stressful things. It's like, yeah, who, you know, what what didn't qualify for this list? Like getting a cancer diagnosis, losing a leg. Um, you know, like <laughs> there's so many, there's ha- having to flee your country. Is that moving? Maybe that's maybe that also falls under moving. Like there's so many things in on unfortunately for humans, the the limit does not exist really on yeah on what, for so. things the limit of things that are way worse than moving it <laughs> feels almost infinite yeah and I'm not just talking about like rare cases like there are plenty of things that happen to a lot of people that are much more stressful than that but anyways that's this is all beside the point the point is that people love to repeat these these pieces of folk wisdom mm-hmm. As if there, as if like there was a, a double blind experiment at some point that confirmed it. Yeah. And there's, yeah, the, 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 ha- the days of the habits, there is no, there is no amount of days that will make a habit. Stick with habit. you forever. Yeah. And I think actually this book is kind of getting at that. Like, that's why you really have to put in a lot of 
effort and thought into making it easy and attractive because it's always going to be easier to not do these things than to do them. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Our friend Alexa asked me once, she said, "Is, is life school for you? By which she meant like, are you someone who lives life as if life itself is a school? So there's like people who just live life, presumably. And then there's people who are like, you know me, like I have little modules for myself throughout the day. I have learning goals. I have reading lists. I have Mm -hmm. all sorts of objectives. Like recently we were talking about how I'm like, I don't feel familiar enough with Shakespeare. So like, you know, I'm going to get that on your syllabus. Yeah. And it's like, why? Like what, what need have I of Shakespeare? It's, it, it's purely just an attitude towards life that, that life is, is some kind of school. Um, and I think of this attitude as being deeply connected to my love of the life of habits, because even on this spacious summer vacation that I'm on, it's all for me, it's all about the modules. It's all about having my little gym class, having my little English class, having my little, you know, stacking those modules throughout the day. Yeah. I don't know. Would you say I'm someone for whom life is school or I'm not like you? What do you think? Well, I I, I guess I don't quite understand it. Like, I, I guess what you're saying is, are you someone who creates like a syllabus for yourself and like, sort of checks the things off the list and what's the alternative like being aimless you just wake up every day and say we'll see well no not being aimless like people can go about their lives and not have it and not have a syllabus but still have a career and a relationship Mm. and you know and and read books also you know but like not being like I need to get my Shakespeare, you know, like it's a different attitude of making little classes for yourself. Yeah. I would say overall, my life is not cluttered with goals like that. No, no, not really. I mean, every, I, I do have things here and there, but certainly not to the extent that you do. You're taking AP English right now. I am reading, reading Moby, Moby Dick. Dick at a snail's pace it's my white whale um and for no reason i do want to read like the canon in my life i give myself ample time to do it though obviously Mm -hmm. between now and death (laughs) you know there are things that i want my life to be made up of but i'm not as like i'm really not goal oriented like in such a substantial way now that being said I do live a very intentional life, Mm. which you told me once. Oh, no. You told me I go through my life with a certain degree of certainty. Yeah, you do. I'm pretty intentional with my life, but it doesn't have to do with like checking things off a list as much. Well, I don't think life as a school is also about checking things off a list. Mm. I don't think I, I don't think that's necessarily the posture one must take towards it but perhaps it can be i don't maybe i don't understand life as a school you know it is what it is (laughs) you do get it i think you do get it you think i'm okay so that's a good question do you think i'm lying about not getting it or you think that like there you think that i think there's more to it and you're like there isn't there there isn't more yeah i think it's okay Okay. Well, for me, life is a dance, dancing with the wind. Now, I want to talk about habits we created or like bad habits we kicked before we read this book. Okay. So he says you have to take it, you have to take self discipline out of it. Like self discipline will never get you there. He believes that we are all weak willed, I guess. Um, And so the, you know, his first law is make it obvious, second, make it attractive, third, make it satisfying or make it easy, fourth, make it satisfying. So, um, you know, it's interesting that he says that, you know, take self-discipline out of it because 
a lot of times I think he is really talking about self-discipline. Like when he says, um, when you go to a restaurant, ask them to put half of your meal in a to-go container before you get it. Like that's self-discipline. You know, when you go, you know, if you want to inspire yourself to go for a run, only listen to your favorite podcast when you run, like that's self-discipline to do that, to not listen to it, you know, whenever you want to. Because the, I think he's saying use self-discipline when it's easy to use self-discipline. It's much easier to say something to a waitress than it is to literally stop yourself when there's still food on the plate in front of you. There's like something so animal about. Yeah, absolutely. Like you, your interpretation might be what he means, but that's not what he says in the book. Do you know what I mean? No, he actually does say that. He says that there are critical moments when we can exert a little energy that will buy us a lot later. And there are other moments where it's really hard to exert that energy. But do you see how what I'm saying? You want to kill me. Do you see how what I'm saying isn't what you said? Because he explicitly says, you do not use self-discipline. Self-discipline will not work. And what I'm saying is he is talking about self-discipline, but he's just pretending like he's not. He's calling it exerting energy instead. Um, I mean, I think that what he's talking about is not having a battle with your will. And I think that he like, I I think that the, the restaurant thing, like having the waitress box up your food beforehand, like, yeah, like everything, every action a human does intentionally is self is self discipline. But when you, say it to the waitress before the food is there you you're not you don't have to battle with yourself like yeah that's like that's fine if that's what he means but that's not what he says well you're deciding that that is self-discipline and that is what he says i don't think he so you don't think being like okay i'm not gonna read any tabloids that's another one any celebrity gossip until i'm on the treadmill at the gym you think that isn't self-discipline i mean Maybe it is, but I don't think it's, I think you're slightly deliberately misunderstanding what he's saying. I think he's trying to take willpower out of the equation so that you're not exactly. And that's with your own hand. But that's exactly my point. You can't take willpower out of the equation. So I don't know why he says that. Because you can by having the waitress box up the food beforehand, by having the... What you're talking about is willpower. It's just placed in a different spot. It's not placed on the plate. It's placed with the waitress. No, but it's it's very different because the, the because we are a council of, of past, future, and present selves. So the self who puts the big barrel of cheese doodles, pornography, and guns in the lower shelf is not the person who wants to shoot the guns, eat the cheese doodles and watch the pornography. The He's saying when you are a self-controlled you who is not in need of the willpower, that's when you take the disciplined action because you're not currently at war with your urge in that So moment. that's when you take the disciplined action. Yeah, that's when, when you not, exert self-discipline. Yeah, when you're not fighting an urge. So it actually doesn't require your willpower in the same way as like... Um, having the food in front of you it's a it's what about the guy what about the guy who would only watch tv when he's on the bike like using a different example okay so like that doesn't take discipline to never watch tv unless you're working out well i don't think that i don't think that speaks to um the tv is an inducement for the biking to take willpower out of the TV would be a different equation. It would be, are you putting He's, the TV away out of sight? No, he says, you can say, I only watch my favorite show when I'm working out. That doesn't take discipline? I mean, yeah, I think it does. But I think... Okay, that's that's what I'm saying. It does, There is discipline. It's in the equation. Yeah, but I think what he's saying is that you are minimizing it and taking it out of the equation wherever possible. Okay, but that isn't what he says. Like, that's my point, is that he's not very, he, he actually contradicts himself. Yeah, I mean, if it, 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 if you want to find, like, a contradiction in it, that's true. But if you want to see it as, like, a principle that says, take 
willpower out of the equation whenever possible because willpower doesn't really work as a method. But that, again, you, advice. that's great. You should write that book where you say that as opposed to what he says. <laughs> okay. He doesn't say that. To contradict himself. You can, you can find the quote where he says, where he says it in such absolute terms as he, as but you did it. find him to contradict himself in other ways. Like where? Where you were like, he says this work, he, this won't work for addiction. And then one paragraph later, he says this will work in every situation. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's just another area where he contradicts himself. Just another subject, which isn't the one we're talking about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I'm desperate to look up that quote where he says there's no such thing as self-discipline. Well, I really um, believe that willpower is a terrible tactic. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's because we're weak willed. I think it's because we're a council of selves. So like when I was trying to quit smoking um, and I, I failed a bunch of times and I remember our friend Mora Mm. said wow it's like you just have no willpower at all <laughs> yeah. what can you believe that she said that that's really hard that's really um, harsh <laughs> and the truth is that I did have willpower but you this is what happens you quit smoking because you want to quit smoking then you're utterly immiserated by the process you feel like life will never have joy ever again mm -hmm. and then you make a decision to smoke again not because you're weak-willed but because a new will has arisen that says actually i think smoking is worth it if life is going to be this miserable which is a totally rational thing to believe mm -hmm. um and when i actually did quit smoking which was a mix of the patch and the alan carr method the alan carr method is totally about taking willpower out of it. And uh, he's like, willpower will not work. Just change your mindset. Now, perhaps you would say, but you have to read the book and the book take, you have to have the discipline to read the book. And it's like, yeah, like you need to do a couple of things still to take the willpower out. But I don't but just, I guess I don't understand why people can't just be more like clear with their language. I mean, he's because getting paid to write this book. I think the principle of the thing is to take, is is to stop wrestling with yourself in this like willpower, just bearing down on yourself way. I just don't know why you can't just say it better. Up. Just say it better. Okay. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, like you could say, yes, you do have to read this book. Get ahead of the problem. Get ahead of the criticisms. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the thing about this book. It's like, you are a believer and I'm a skeptic. Yeah, I'm a, what would like the fans of James Clear be called? I'm a, I'm a, I'm clear headed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit more like, you know, it's, a, it's not an attractive life to me either. Like when I was reading this book, I was like, you know, we were both trying to cultivate these habits and I felt like my life was one big to-do list, you know, and I didn't enjoy that. Yeah. And I love that. Like I get absolutely high from like a day of perfectly executed habits. Sometimes yeah. like if I like really nail my nighttime routine, I'm like, it makes me too giddy to sleep. Like I've actually <laughs> realized that I need like a sloppier night to get to bed because <laughs> if I like really hit every point and I like even remember to like set up the stuff for the coffee tomorrow and like everything's in its place. I just can't go to bed after that because it's like I'm so <laughs> geared up from this like thrilling perfectly you know it's like the scene in it's like the final scene in Black Swan <laughs> really like becomes the Black Swan and dances the dance with like full full her full powers <laughs> yeah it's interesting because it's like <laughs> it's like we don't live such different lives like we engage in such similar activities Mm -hmm. you know we're both we both like clean all the time we both you know you take longer walks than me but we both are walkers you know we've both started meditating but we have such different sensibilities about it I think yes I get carried <laughs> away though that's 
I'm not clear headed. I'm not, I'm, I, I, I'm carried away. And yeah, I get, I get really swept up and I got really swept up in atomic habits. I mean, and you said this too, like if you want better habits, just read this book. Cause it will, it will jazz you up. It will jazz you up. And for me, it made me feel so guilty when I was reading it that I hadn't flossed that day that I would just get up in the middle of reading it, floss real quick, and come back to it. <laughs> so just be constantly reading this book and you will go to the gym. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, you know, how did you make the floss attractive and satisfying? I don't. It's not. You told me to listen to a podcast. I probably should, but I haven't been. Um, yeah, I mean, and now that I'm going to start flossing, it's like, you know, will flossing be part of goddess hour? The dentist did say that the before bed floss is most important, but I think it's the floss you do. The before bed floss. He does he imply that there should be a two day floss to a day. He, yeah, he was like, if you only do one floss a day, may, <laughs> may it be the before bed one. And it's like, and then he flossed me. Have I ever told you? <laughs> Did he show you the technique? Um. I feel like they've updated the technique in recent years. It's all about scraping that, scraping yes. it down. Yes. It's not he, just about getting the flaws between the teeth. He showed me the technique. So I have this idea for a floss, a floss salon. <laughs> Why must oral hygiene be medicalized can't we go somewhere for a teeth cleaning but in a way that is sensual pleasure focused cosmetic a salon so like the way people used to get a shave every day yes it would be like going to get a shave it's like you would go you wouldn't go too often you know it's a it's a nice thing you go maybe there's like a little neck massage involved so do you floss in between the floss the floss salon oh yeah you have to be doing your daily floss but oh. this, and they have you know it's like the at the nail salon all the different colors it's like they have all these different flosses on big spools <laughs> <laughs> Big, there's like a wall of spools and it's like bubblegum, lavender, thyme, sage, really, you know, anything beef jerky, <laughs> savory, whatever you want, you can get. And they can you get your them. tongue scrapes. Oh, yeah. You get your tongue scrapes. Mm. This is a full mouth workup, but it's not medical. and It's not aggressive. The idea is not to solve any long-term problems the idea is to make your mouth feel clean and to make you feel beautiful you know what you know what i've always wished i probably told you this that your teeth that our teeth were just a whole different thing like pop out a bowl you just pop them out every night put them in a jar (laughs) like a denture but they're all individuals Mm, or you can just pop one out at a time and just wash it and under the faucet you know what i mean well if you get an implant as i saw a poster at the dentist. Today. Those don't pop though. No, they don't. They're screwed yeah. in. So why not make them poppable? <laughs> pop it in, pop it out. Yeah, well, you know, I've sometimes wondered if we'd be better off the second you get your adult teeth. <laughs> you go to the dentist, you get them all pulled. It's the worst day of your life. <laughs> it's the worst day of your life. But then they install get- poppable teeth. They install poppable plastic teeth. You never have to worry about it again a day in your life. You go to the dentist, they go, oh, you haven't been brushing these plastic teeth. Who cares? Here's a lot of out. Replace it. Yeah, they'll be $12.99. <laughs> they're, they're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I love this new world where they're cheap. I think we our version of habits is better than James Clear's. I think it's... Set things up. What what did the vet say? Set things up so that things go well for yourself. Set things up so things go well for yourself. Put the floss where you can see it. Only do things you hate that are good for you. If they last less than 10 minutes. minutes. Great rule. That's a great rule. They last less than 10 minutes. Keep that list of things you hate short. Like with my workout, my daily workout, I hate doing push-ups. But I do them for under 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. The rest of the workout, 
I don't like it, but I don't hate it. It doesn't make me miserable. There you go. The 10 minute rule. The 10 minute rule. There we have it. And don't make your life like 110 minute things. But anyway, I don't need to say that. You, you get it. Yeah. How many do we have a rule for that, though? How many 10 minute things you can have? Um, I would. It has to be less than five. Yeah. Under an hour of hatred. Yeah. Under an hour of hatred. That doesn't mean everything has to be something you love. It just no, means no. You can only have misery. Yeah, the hatred list has to be small. Like you really have to hate it. Like the way I hate flossing. And five is probably honestly, you're pushing it. Under five. And okay, so up to four. Up to four. That's a weird yeah. way of saying it. Sorry. So yeah, everyone try these rules. <laughs> And let us know how it goes. Let us know if it goes better than reading Atomic Habits. I really would recommend this book for people who maybe there's one or two things in their lives that they think they really want to cultivate. They think it would make their lives better, more enjoyable, more, you know, give themselves healthier in mind, body, spirit. I would recommend this book. I think it's a really good start, but also, you know, just don't get too extreme with it. That would be my advice. Great advice. And if you want to quit smoking... Read Alan Carr. Yeah. Um, housekeeping. Um, a listener of the podcast, Noi in Israel, pointed out to me that um, this quote about the void from Sarah Silverman is actually a quote from her character, Geraldine, in Take This Waltz. I somehow remember her saying it in an in interview. Maybe she was quoting her own character. Mm, well, I've seen that movie. It's a great movie. Everyone should watch it. She plays a side character um, in it, but it is, I love it. It's a sweet little movie. So yeah, I'm going to watch that because I saw her say it somewhere else. So I think she quoted quoted the movie, referenced it. Um, anyways, love part. And the other thing that I want to say is that um, dear friend of, of the How To Be podcast, um, dear friends of the How To Be podcast, uh, Zach and Marissa Schultz, my brother and my sister-in-law. Brothy Schultz. Brothy Schultz and Sissy Schultz sponsored a trip to the sensory deprivation tank. Sponsored a boy's journey into, into sen- a sense-free life, a sense-free moment. A sensory moment and not for me. Tell us about it a little bit. Okay. So it's salty. Okay, that makes sense. Think it's going to be quiet, but the sound of your own heartbeat and breath pounding in your ears is awful. Yikes, scary. I had no visions. (laughs) You were in it for the visions is the thing. I was in it for the visions. I had no visions. Um, I experienced uh, itchiness and boredom. (laughs) Now I'm going to tell you the worst part which is that there was a sign on the door that said, "Oh no! if you leave behind any bodily fluids in the tank, we will charge you a thousand dollars because we mm. have to drain the tank, <laughs> sanitize the tank and resalt the tank. And that means that they aren't draining the tank every time. They only- I had just assumed that they drain the tank every time. But they only drain the tank if they find a mystery fluid. Do you think they check for fluids every time? I I mean, it looked clean to me and I just had to I just had to do it like it freaked me out when I read that, but I was like, Cause "All did right. You, did you wear you didn't you wear a swimming suit?" No, you're naked, but this idea did, Why you, are you uh, naked? Okay. Do you really think that a swimsuit prevents contact between your body and the water? That's what we're all lying to ourselves about in a public pool, which I actually refuse to go in now. Then why aren't we just, ooh, why aren't we just naked? Because of you don't show your genitals to other people. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, all right. Well, that is upsetting to me and you know talk about not going with the flow in life like getting in a public pool is always a little bit of a it's a high I have to hype myself up I have to try be like you have to live a normative life <laughs> <laughs> so we we greatly 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 appreciate the generousness of the brother and sissy foundation for yes, absolutely 
um, a sensory deprivation moment, but we are going to have to give it two thumbs down for saltiness and yuck. But no fear because there will be other sponsorship opportunities in the future. Exactly. If you would like to sponsor an experience. Sponsor a boy. Sponsor a boy or a gal. Or a gal. Um, All right, Matt. Well, I hope we talk soon. I think we might. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye.